Deep in every pilot's psyche, there resides an acutely trained mental process, which is dedicated solely to aiding the pilot's reaction in a time-critical emergency situation. As pilots, we inherently accept the fact that emergencies or abnormal situations can arise. And however slight the chance of experiencing a real-life emergency may be, a great pilot will always have a mental plan of attack should such a situation arise. Oftentimes, this plan could evolve from the memory of a checklist or even from the recollection of a thorough pre-flight brief. Regardless, each pilot's individual reaction to any number of abnormal or emergency situations will be predicated on the amount and quality of that pilot's previous training and the breadth of his or her experience as an aviator. On this UND Aerocast episode, we will attempt to tackle the decision-making and procedural steps specific to the Cessna 172 that must combine to give a pilot the best chance of surviving an engine failure and a subsequent emergency approach and landing. Please, as with any UND Aerocast episode, understand that this video is designed to supplement your aviation education and at no time should you attempt any emergency simulation in an aircraft unless on a dual flight with a certified flight instructor. The objective of a simulated emergency landing is to develop the pilot's accuracy, judgment, planning, procedures, and confidence when little or no power is available. The airplane will be flown from the point of simulated engine failure to where a safe landing could be made utilizing proper emergency cockpit procedures. When an engine fails, the pilot is confronted with a situation known as a forced landing. Because whether or not the engine has completely failed or is experiencing a significant power reduction, the airplane has now reached a point where further continued flight is impossible. The decision-making process and procedural steps that follow the engine failure will be based on the time a pilot has to address the situation. And in the case of an engine failure, time is an absolute function of altitude. According to Chapter 16 in the FAA's Airplane Flying Handbook, you can assume that from the point of an engine failure, the average pilot reaction time will be about 4 seconds. The maximum glide chart in Chapter 3 of the Cessna 172 POH shows that a 172 with a windmilling propeller and flaps up will maintain a gliding descent at approximately 800 feet per minute as long as the pilot maintains the best glide speed of 68 knots. Now, an engine failure can obviously occur at any infinite combination of altitudes and airspeeds. Simplifying this thought, we can say that the way we as pilots address the engine failure will be determined by whether the failure occurs at a higher or lower altitude. An engine failure at 4,000 feet AGL should give an average pilot the time necessary to troubleshoot the problem, secure the airplane, and choose the most ideal landing spot. In contrast, an engine failure at, say, 800 feet AGL, just after takeoff and at a low airspeed, may only allow the pilot enough time to lower the nose and select a limited amount of landing points to either side of the departure path. If a pilot were to experience an engine failure during cruise at 4000 AGL, the initial response should be to take a breath, focus, and fly the airplane. This means that the pilot must control the airplane's pitch in order to achieve the best glide speed and the pilot must maintain coordination with rudder in order to avoid a stall spin situation. Remember, aviate, navigate, and then communicate. By flying the plane, the pilot is buying some time. The pilot should be constantly trimming the airplane and holding altitude while airspeed slows from cruise to best glide speed. As the airplane continues to decelerate, the pilot must run the memorized engine failure flight checklist specific to the Cessna 172. This initial memory procedure is designed as a quick troubleshoot to help the pilot get the engine restarted. If the engine fails to restart, the pilot's thought process must immediately turn to the successful completion of a forced landing. Maintaining best glide airspeed, the pilot will now begin searching for a general landing area and plan to maneuver to touch down as close as possible to that selected area. 
As the power off glide continues, the pilot should quickly narrow this area down to a specific landing spot as the terrain becomes more visible and defined. A suitable touchdown spot should be based on several factors, including the direction and strength of the wind and the presence of obstacles near and around the point. Typically, a compromise will have to be made between wind direction and known obstacles, but ultimately, the pilot is attempting to choose a point that will allow for the airplane to be landed into the wind with minimum obstacles in the approach or landing path. By landing into the wind, the pilot is minimizing the airplane's ground speed as much as possible at the point of touchdown. A slower relative ground speed will also help to minimize the subsequent ground roll and will give the pilot and passengers a better chance to avoid injury should the landing encounter obstacles or unanticipated hazards. Once the pilot has chosen an adequate landing spot, the glide should be diverted in a straight line until the airplane is directly above the point of intended touchdown. With this accomplished, the pilot has essentially guaranteed that the spot can be reached. If you haven't watched it already, it's time to go back and review the Aerocast episode entitled Steep Spirals, because this is the point where the pilot can put that training to use by circling down over the planned touchdown spot. The plan should be to end up abeam the touchdown spot on the downwind at about 1,000 feet AGL, which is a typical traffic pattern altitude. 